Hey! Hello! Well, what? Well, I'm back, guys. There you are. Everybody, everybody. Hey! Yeah, we're here now. Everybody's here now. Hey, and you are all here, too. Great. Uh, so where, where am I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to find out. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to our Sunday night offering of astronomy edu edutainment, the Sunday night astronomy show. Hey. My name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm also an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Yay! Yeah. Okay, uh, well, I'm very pleased to welcome back my two regular co-hosts this evening, Mr. Paul Owen from the, the uh, Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton. Paul, evening. Hello, hello. And also Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Good night, Mike. Soon to be named Lake Observatory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'd like to welcome all of you tonight and all of you who are joining us uh, on YouTube and Facebook and everybody who's been joining us through the uh, local Rogers TV network. Uh, thank you for your support. Okay, so on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, now it's only two weeks from tomorrow when we get the rare opportunities to experience a total solar eclipse. Uh, and we want you to be as prepared as possible to enjoy this most magical of celestial events. Uh, but what uh, will actually happen. How rare are they really? And what do I need to know? Well, these questions will be answered by our guest this evening, our local astronomy guru and RASC member, Mr. Kurt Nason, has joined us this evening. Kurt? Howdy! Yay! Along your question for an interesting and informative program tonight. And, of course, we're going to have Vinyl Bud. We'll be back as well with another fine binocular target of the week. Paul will present another interesting Rosanna's fun fact. This evening, I'm going to talk just a little bit about contests. I don't have any pictures to share tonight, but I don't think we're going to have time for them anyway, because I think we're just going to get into a nice, uh, lively discussion here. Um, so I will uh, be talking a little bit more about the kids' contest coming up. Uh, uh, actually, that's happening right now. So sit back, grab yourself your favorite beverage, and enjoy the show with us. And as always, if you have any questions, please post them here on YouTube and Facebook. So let's get started, guys, with the discussion around the most magical of all celestial events happening soon. To me, it's the most magical. How about you, Kurt? Never seen one. Never seen one. So it's going to be magical. <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't do a disappearing act and clouds. All right. Yep. Well, we're set. Here we go. So we're having this total eclipse of the sun in two weeks. All right, so if any of the times you see on here, these are mainly for the, uh, say, the western part of New Brunswick and the eastern part, it might be a minute or two difference there. Of course, this is Atlantic uh, daylight times, so if you're watching in other parts of the country or other countries, it's going to be different. All right, so what we're going to see here, first contact is when the moon starts to take a bite out of the sun. So for us, it'll be down around the around the five o'clock position uh, because the moon is actually moving uh, west to east in the sky, even though it looks like it's going east to west, but that's from Earth's rotation. So around 3.25 p.m., we'll get that first contact when it takes that bite out. And over the next um, hour, I think for us it's about an hour and 10 minutes, and it's going to slowly cover up the sun. And it's just going on like that. It gets you something to look at, uh, but you don't want to look at it for too long because actually it gets pretty boring to watch that. All right, so we'll get up. Once it gets up a little bit over halfway covered, uh, you might notice a drop in the temperature. Usually when you get a temperature change like that, the wind will pick up. This is April 8th. So in uh, much of Canada, at least, and say New England states, it's still going to be a little bit chilly. So if you're out there, maybe even if it is a nice day, you should have some extra clothes with you because once it gets starts to get dark like that, the temperature can drop quite considerably and you will feel it. All right, so that'll go on as it gets closer and closer to being totally covered up. What you want to do is look around, see what's happening in nature. Right? You don't actually see a total eclipse in the sun, you experience it. There's more than, more than just your sight involved in there. So watch what's happening in, in nature. So you've got birds around there. Quite often it's getting there like that. They think it's nighttime coming. They might be you be trying to have their last bit of a snack before they go to bed, then they'll settle down, stop chirping, and, and get ready to go to sleep. 
Right, other animals can be uh, affected as well. A herd of uh, cows will um, start to come home, um, looking for something to eat, of course, and then they're going to prepare for the night. I read a story about um, cows in Australia when it came totally dark. All these cows started mooing, and it was very, very loud. Once the sun came back out, they stopped. Another one I've read about in India, there, as soon as they get the total eclipse, a bunch of ants came out of the hill, started heading off to do whatever they do at nighttime. And then when the sun came out, they came right back in again. So look what's happening there in nature. But you'll notice maybe the, as it gets darker and darker, the shadows start to get sharper. So take a look at shadow on your hand. You might notice it's not quite so fuzzy around the edges anymore. Colors in nature are going to be a little bit more intense. They pick that up. When you get to see shadow bands, they're very subtle. You might have, you might see it, you might not. We need a clear sky for that and preferably a white ground in front of you. Now, in parts of New Brunswick, particularly in the north, you're probably going to have a white ground in front of you unless people have tramped through it with muddy boots, right, with, with the snow up there. So you might see uh, intermittent gray and bright gray and light, gray and light streaming across the ground in front of you. Again, they're very subtle. You don't always get to see them. That's another, usually a, you know, a couple of minutes before it's completely dark. Once you get up to the just the seconds before totality, look off to the west and see you can see the, the shadow of the moon. It's traveling at the one to two kilometers per second. And you see this big dark shadow heading toward you. I've read of somebody who has actually seen several eclipses before. And when he saw the shadow coming to him, he ducked. Right? So watch out for that one. Then when you get into those dying seconds of it, you might get to see two things. Uh, you got Bailey's beads and the diamond ring effect. Now here's the shadow. There's a couple of pictures taken about one second apart during the total eclipse in Wyoming in 2017. So on this side here, you can just start to see a shadow coming there. And just about a second later, it's much, much darker rushing toward you. Now Bailey's beads, the moon's outer surface last probably looks smooth, but we've all seen pictures of the moon with craters and mountain peaks. And so there are going to be some of these along the, the limb of the moon like this. So that last little, last little bit of sunlight coming through there will be flashing back and forth between, uh, between mountain peaks and through craters. And it'll only last a few seconds. Named for uh, Francis Bailey, who was an astronomer in England in the 1840s. And he wasn't the first to see them. They'd been seen before. Uh, several times, but he, uh, he wrote about them, and so they got they got uh, named after him. So once they go through, typically you'll get the diamond ring effect. That's a last little bit of flash, uh, of sunlight, and it's going to be a, a brilliant flash. And it was a woman in France in the in the eighteen hundreds who compared that to a diamond ring. Other things that we got: uh, look overhead when the, just about that time. You'll see a deep blue sky because the blue light of the sun is getting scattered upward like that. And look around you, the whole horizon might take on a red color. This red might be, uh, wouldn't be scattered upward like that. There's a few things to see there. So all, as it's all happening, just look around, take in the whole total effect. When do we get totality? And second contact here, that's when the moon completely covers the sun. It'll be around 4.34 p.m., right? This is where things can get loud. Now, you think of uh, societies from uh, long ago that maybe that didn't know how eclipses happened. To them, the moon was being, or the, at least the sun was disappearing in the sky. Some place like China, they thought it was being eaten by a dragon. Right? So, and it, I think there's other places that said it was like a frog eating the sun or different things like that. So they go and make a lot of noise and shouting, banging things that make loud noises, things like that. And it worked. The sun reappeared. So, of course, that's going to get around. So the next time one happens, people still make loud noises. But you, you can do that if you want. We know that the, the sun is going to come out. At least hopefully it will. Right? So all the time you're watching the eclipse, the partial phase of the eclipse, you need to have eye protection. You must have these the eclipse glasses or some other things, and I'll show you what these can be later on here. But uh, once it's total eclipse, 
the moon completely covers the sun, so there's no sunlight coming, then it is safe to watch without eye protection. And depending on, just be aware of how much time you're going to have there. And it's going to happen a lot quicker than what you think. So if you got things that you want to do, maybe with binoculars or something like that, try to do that early in it. So you're not caught looking at the eclipse, at the uh, eclipse sun with binoculars when it comes back out. Try to do that at the beginning part of it. All right, so you might see some little bit of red around the sun. And what you will see, provided you take your glasses off, if you have your glasses off, you're going, if you have them on, you're going to miss this. And it's probably the most spectacular sight to see in nature. This is the outer part of the sun, called the corona. Right? And temperature up in here can get to be about one or two million degrees, compared to about uh, 5,500 uh, Celsius on the part of the sun that uh, we typically see through clouds in the daytime. And here's these red prominences around here. All right, so this is, the red is from hydrogen gas. If you've seen pictures of the sun that looks like flame on the outside, it's actually plasma or gas that's so hot it can't hold on to electrons and it gets caught in the electric, uh, electromagnetic field of the, magnetic field of the sun and they loop out and back in. So that's what we're seeing here. And if you're using binoculars or a telescope, you might enhance the view of those prominences. And it might look different from different eclipses. They found that the corona has a different shape when we're near uh, the sunspot cycle's maximum, which is happening later this year or sometime next year. So when it's like that, we get to see all these rays poking out here like that. Whereas if we're looking at one during the minimum phase of this 11-year cycle, tend to be more out here just around the, uh, the um, equator of the sun and you get these rays bouncing out around the poles. In between, you get them like that. So we'd probably see one pretty much like that this time. And one thing we can see, it's getting dark. It's not going to be like a really dark night because the, the, total, the eclipse sun with a corona, that's about as bright as the full moon. It's, it's not going to be totally dark or anything like that. But the brightest stars and planets will be able to pop out like that. So look around for them. Maybe we'll see the space station. Maybe a comet. That's what I was hoping for when I did this last year. So actually, the space station, when I look, it makes two passes during the eclipse, but they're both in the middle part, for, at least for us, the middle part of the partial phases. So we're not likely to see the space station. But there is a comet, Comet 12P Plans Brooks. It will be at its brightest around the middle of April. So around this time, April 8th, it should be fairly bright, not bright enough to see it with the naked eye unless it goes into one of his famous outbursts when it gets much brighter for a few days. And so to look in here, here's the eclipse sun. So we're about uh, 33 degrees altitude here in, in New Brunswick when that happens. Down here to the lower right is Venus. Now you can see Venus in daytime. Uh, anytime, if you know exactly where to walk, look and if it's not too close to the sun. I've run across it just by accident a couple of times. So that should pop out of the sky if you're looking for it um, before the even before totality, but you're going to have your glasses on, so you won't see that. And up in here, we have Jupiter, which is typically usually the second brightest planet, and it's going to be up higher in the sky, which makes it easier to see. And that should certainly pick, be picked out. The brightest stars, uh, here's the brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, brighter than any other star. That's the dog star. And up here we have Orion. You can just barely see three stars for his belt here. Seventh brightest star in the sky, Rigel in his knee. And ninth or tenth brightest star up here in his armpit, Betelgeuse, which means armpit of the giant. So these ones will be out. Uh, up in here we have Taurus and Aldebaran in there. It's an orange giant star. You might be able to pick that one out too. Now I'm going to take a quick look at binoculars for Mercury up in here and Comet. 12 P. Pons Brooks up in here. It'd be about that, just over a binocular width down, uh, let's say, lower right of uh, Jupiter. I'll give a quick look at them. If I don't get them, I'm going to be taking in everything else that's going on there. All right, so it's going to be a very, very short period of time. So in New Brunswick, uh, the most we get here in New Brunswick could be up around Heartland, about three minutes and 21 seconds. Right? If you're down near the southern limit of it, it could be, I grew up in McAdam. And there, it's at the world-famous railroad station there. It's about 18 seconds of totality. And if you're uh, elsewhere, it's uh, depending on how close you are to the center line, and we'll see where that is a little bit later. 
you're going to have more. But the maximum in the Brunswick could be about three minutes and 21 seconds. The maximum anywhere down in Mexico would be about four minutes and roughly 25 seconds. All right. We can go on that one. Third contact. That's when the moon starts to come off. Now, when it happens here, what you're going to see first probably could be Bailey's beads or the diamond ring effect. Right, as soon as you see them, it's, you have to put your safety, your eclipsal glasses back on. Right, it'll be a, a flash of light there, but it's very brief. It wouldn't cause eye damage. So as soon as you see that, that's the indication to put your eclipse glasses back on. You need that eye protection for the rest of the time, for the partial phases of the eclipse. As that's going on, uh, you should notice it gets lighter. So the sun's poking up, maybe warming up again just a little bit later in the day. And the, act, and the animals start to become active again. The, the birds wake up scratching their heads, wondering that was a short night, what happened? And you know, see what else is going on there. It might get louder for you in this way because uh, quite often people like to leave now. They've seen the partial phase at the beginning. They want to beat the traffic, get out. And so in the 2017 eclipse, there was huge traffic jams. Uh, people were stuck in traffic, nothing moving for seven hours at a time. And so Maybe in the Brunswick, it won't be that bad. Uh, for us, maybe 10 or 20 cars lined up might be a, a traffic jam. But uh, uh, it's it, you won't get to see the this again, so it may as well take in the whole thing. So you'd get another hour and maybe 10 minutes of the partial phase at the end of that eclipse. And around 5.43 p.m. is fourth contact when the moon is completely off the sun. And all that's left is your memories. So what you want to do is enjoy the totality while you can. Take it in as much as you can. Look around, there's so many other things happening, and travel home safely and patiently, unless you're lucky enough to see it there from your house. What I mean is by enjoy totality while you can, don't waste your time trying to take pictures. Don't go fiddling around with cameras, unless you're an expert on this and you've seen two or three total eclipses before. It'll be a long, long time before you get another one, unless you uh, unless you travel around to see them, which a lot of people do. But don't go fiddling with the camera. Need a couple of quick shots during the totality with your phone. Like, take your time and watch things that are going on there. And that's wise words from Mike Mean here. <laughs> Probably won't be doing this. <laughs> All right, where do we see it? Okay, so it, comes in, it starts in the Pacific. Uh, near Hawaii, or just this side of Hawaii. It comes growing up the Pacific, across Mexico and southern Texas. The mid part of the states here, it goes into southern Ontario, Hamilton, Kingston. They're both in the totality there. Toronto's outside of it, just, just barely. Through Quebec, I think the northern limit runs through Montreal. And then it runs through uh, Vermont and uh, Maine, Hampshire a bit, and through New Brunswick, and up in here through the Maritimes. So when it comes up out of Maine, it runs through the central half of New Brunswick here, the western half of Prince Edward Island. Just catches a little bit of the northern tip here of Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia, and pretty much the western, middle western part of Newfoundland. So that's where it's going to be. Now, this blue line, that's the center of the shadow. And in two here, it's roughly 180 kilometers wide. So it's a pretty generous one here. So up and around here, you're going to be, it's just had about three minutes and 20 seconds or so. Miramichi gets a little bit less, maybe uh, 10 seconds less. Here's a little close-up of what we got. So the northern part is just above Grand Falls. The southern part runs right through Macadam. That's why they have such a, a short period of time for totality there. Uh, you got through Harvey, a little bit south of Oromocto, where they get uh, maybe a little bit more than a minute. Uh, Fredericton up here gets about two minutes and 10 to 15 seconds. Runs through here and just above Moncton. Now, if you take a closer look at that, uh, expand the map out, you'll find that the southern limit of it pretty much touches the Trans-Canada Highway by the uh, Magnetic Hill Zoo. All right, so if you go in there, take a run up, you might get 10 seconds right there in the zoo, but if you're going there, you might as well go farther north and get more. Right, Miramichi has about three minutes and roughly 10 seconds up here. So we've got... Heartland, very close to the center line, Floresville, Bristol, and Woodstock, and not far. Doaktown, Blackville, all great areas to see it. Rogersville up here. 
you notice that there's not much in Nova Scotia. Most people in Prince Edward Island are probably going in their own province to see it. Same thing as uh, Newfoundland, uh, just a slightly less time for totality. Probably not worth uh, traveling to New Brunswick for the extra bit of it. But a lot of people will be coming up from Nova Scotia because they don't get any of it except for that little bit there in the northern tip of Cape Breton Island. So if you get a lot of people coming in, either it's cloudy everywhere else or it's people coming from Nova Scotia. Plus people from uh, southern New Brunswick, St. John's outside of it as well. And uh, Bathurst out, Campbellton's out, Edmonton's out. So people in the north and people in the south are going to be traveling more toward the center line to catch that eclipse because it'll be a long time before the next one. If you do stay, uh, Camelton gets about a 99% covered, same as St. John. The farther away you are from the, uh, the totality, the less and less uh, the sun is going to be uh, covered by the moon. So any time, any other time, this would probably be the uh, astronomical highlight of the decade, just to see it like this. But the way I look at it, when you get a short trip to see totality, if you buy a lottery ticket, you're off by one number, this is what you get. $10,000, say. If you're in totality, that would be like winning a million dollars. If you're at the center line, that would be like winning $10 million. A few things going on in different areas, uh, particularly those near the center line. Miramichi, they have a three-day conference going on for the weekend and on the Monday of the eclipse. Guest speakers brought in uh, astronomy trade show. Uh, the eclipse observing there at the airport, expecting a lot of people. Florenceville, Bristol, they've got uh, talked about it before. Uh, Chris Atro will be there for a presentation on the Monday night. Uh, you see about the Bloomborn telescope and the camera's going up, uh, going up very high. In case that happens to be cloudy, they would be seeing down a live feed of the eclipse. Right? It will be public observing there as well. Fredericton's very busy. They've got the events going on that weekend, but they talks at the library, be things at Science East, or things at UNB. And some of the other towns will be having special things going on as well. A little bit about why we don't want to stare at the sun and why we don't want to look at it too much here without, without the proper protection, or we don't want to look at it at all without the proper protection. And we have our cornea here, so we get the light coming from the sun. Now, sunlight during the total eclipse is no different than the sunlight during the day. There's nothing extra magical about it. We never look at the sun because it's Frankly, it's difficult to do that. It's, you know, you tend to squint and look away from it, which is a smart thing to do. And besides, there'd be nothing really to see. However, during an eclipse, there is something to see, so people want to take a look at it. You have to take yourself, no, I'm not going to look at that unless I've got proper eye protection. Now, the sun gives off different types of lights, and we can see some we can't. One of these would be the ultraviolet light, which gives us these sunburns. And that most of that gets taken up by the cornea here. There's also infrared light, which is what we feel from as heat from the sun. So that will come through. And if you're staring at the sun without protection, that heat comes in there. It could build up and start to uh, actually cook the tissue in there. So if you're staring at it that for a long time without the protection, that could happen and cause serious damage. Now, the visible light coming in. We've got a retina here. In the middle here, we've got our rod, our cone cells, red, green, and blue ones. And they're, it's, uh, they're sensitive to light. So when the light hits the, those cone cells, there's a photochemical reaction. You send a signal through the optic nerve into the brain. So there's three types of cells in there, uh, many, many of each, looking for light that has wavelengths corresponding to red, green, and blue. And each of them will send that signal through. And your brain, takes that, turns it into what you're actually looking at, and applies the color to it. Because light doesn't have any color whatsoever. The color is all in our head. It's done by the brain. Circling that is the red cells that we use for our, our night vision. Right? So the very, very sensitive light. And we have that intense sunlight coming through there. Uh, even though it's being blocked somewhat by the, by the uh, moon, even when it's almost completely blocked, there's still enough intensity there to wipe those cells out. It's going to likely going to be temporary. It could be uh, damaged out for like hours, could be days, could be months. You really don't know. And the big thing about this, there are no pain sensors in here. You would not feel a thing until the next day, or maybe a day or two after, when you realize that, oh, there's something wrong with my eye here. There's a little black spot in here. 
So those cells in there could be taken out of service, depending on how long you're looking. But again, it could be short time, temporary, could be a long time. In some cases, it could be permanent. Now, if you're looking at the sun during the eclipse era with binoculars or telescope and it's not completely covered, you're intensifying that amount of light that's coming through there. And it's much, much going to be, it's going to be much, much worse. Right? Those cells could be taken out permanently. And what's more is the, the what doesn't hit the cells, you get all this tissue in here, that will absorb that visible light and re-emit it as infrared light. And that will literally cook the tissue inside your eye, get blisters forming in there, and that could be permanent damage. So you might wind up with a black spot in front of your eye, and it's not going to go away. And again, you won't know that until probably the next day. So be safe. So staring at the sun will cause temporary or permanent eye damage fairly quickly. You don't feel pain or notice a problem until at least hours later. During the partial phase of the eclipse, there's something to see. The intensity is less, so you have a tendency to look at it, but always make sure that you have your eye protection on there during the partial phases of the eclipse. During the total phase, when the moon completely covers the sun, it is safe to look without any eye safety equipment. But be prepared to put them back on. As soon as you start to see that see the diamond ring effect with Bailey's beads, put them back on. Okay. Take no chances. So we have the eclipse glasses. Right. This is one thing, and there are a lot of them out there. And they go through uh, safety testing. So there are several of them. If you look on the website of the American Astronomical Society, they list companies and dealers that are, have some that have been certified. Uh, they've gone through the testing. So when you use these, I'm to do what they look like. So look down, put them on before you look at the sun, and then look up. Now, before you even start to use them, check them. Make sure that there are no punctures through here, uh, no serious scratches or anything like that. They're not damaged. Make sure the cardboard's not peeling off on there. And also, when you have them on, don't walk around. And they also say in the safety parts in here, when you get them, Read the fine print in there. Good advice. Don't walk around with the monk because you can't see anything else. And again, I mentioned the corona is by brightness of the full moon. If you have these on during the total part, you won't see the corona. Don't use heavy machinery and don't drive with them on. Now, they also recommend you don't use them for any more than uh, three minutes at a time. Right? So they say they're, they're okay to use for up to three minutes of continuous viewing or a few hours of intermittent viewing. And really, you're not going to see much just anyway. You probably want to just take a look at the sun for you know, several seconds, see where it is, uh, maybe share them with somebody else at the time, get them back, take a look at the sun again just to watch the progression of the moon. Because right? nobody's really going to want to stand there and watch the whole thing like for 60 to 70 minutes. It's not that much to see. So just do that intermittently. And it's recommended to do that, that way. Otherwise, um, you know, there could be some damage. And I mentioned the reputable dealers. You can find them on the website of the American Astronomical Society. And do not use them in conjunction with binoculars or a telescope. They are not made for that. You damage them very, very quickly. It cause severe damage to your eyes. We could also use, although they're hard to get, uh, welders. Uh, the darkest shade is number 14, and it's safe to use those, but right, you get one big enough to cover your eyes. A number 13 shade is equivalent to these eclipse glasses, and a number 12 shade is uh, safe as well, but most people will find them too bright for comfort. So you might see um, number 14, perhaps, it might could be easier to get. But if you go to a welding shop, they might have to order them in special, because I don't think they're all that common anymore. If you have the welding, say helmet with shades that uh, change automatically, if they might not have that shade on there, or they might not uh, change quickly enough to save your eyes, so don't use those. Do not use sunglasses or even several sunglasses. See a picture of somebody with had five on at one time. Uh, if he didn't have the eye damage, he's lucky. Indirect viewing is one thing you can do as well. I take a piece of cardboard, Look down here, I cut a piece, I cut a hole out of the cardboard, 
Get a piece of tin foil to it. All right, and then poke a little hole in it with a pin. I might try a couple of holes, a small one, maybe one a little bit bigger to see which one works. And hold that up to the shoulder, let the sunlight come through, and then project it onto a, a white background for better contrast. And that will show you the partial phases of the eclipse. Most people make these with a zero box. There's lots of things on the internet that show you how to make these. Or you can just fold your hands and let sunlight come through and make tiny holes in your hands. Or uh, maybe a colander you've got in the kitchen. Let the sunlight come through that, project it onto a, a white background for the uh, contrast, and you see several partial eclipses going through the things like that. I also mentioned leaves. I don't have that picture on here anymore. Uh, but holes in the leaves or between the leaves will give you several eclipses on there. But April 8th, we're not going to have many trees that there will be on. So you can just forget that one. If it is cloudy, you can pick it up. Uh, it be several live feeds on the internet and probably somebody on television station might have it as well. One in 1963, I watched it on television. If you're looking at the sun with telescopes, it is safe if you have the proper filters on the front of them. There's one here that I use for looking at the sun every day that I can. There's a filter on here that blocks off, just like the glasses, uh, they block off the infrared and ultraviolet light and it allows enough visible light through it to be safe. Now these are gonna be even sturdier, light, even less light through because I'm using it with a telescope. So I've been doing this for over 20 years. And it looks like tinfoil on there, but it isn't. And you might have one like this, it's made just for looking at the sun. All right, one of the bonuses here for watching during the partial phases, particularly if you've been looking through a filter telescope, is we're going to likely have a lot of sunspots on there, so you can watch the moon moving across and covering up sunspots. Or if you have one of those special telescopes, you can see the prominences on the side, and it covers those up as well. This is a picture of Paul took here in uh, St. John in the 2017 eclipse. Weather prospects up through here is Jay Anderson's map. You can see where this is percent cloud cover for April 8th over say, the last uh, period of time. All right, so Texas and Mexico, you might get uh, 10 to 20% cloud cover, which is pretty good. It gets worse as you come up through the states here. You get, you get the Appalachians in here, in places with mountains tend to get up cloudier. Once you get up into Canada, it's not looking quite so good, like 70 to 80 to 90% cloud cover on average. Right through here in New Brunswick as well. So except here in the southern part where St. John is, maybe in the east part, because you get uh, tend to get somewhat fewer clouds on the coastlines because of the winds coming off the water. So it's not looking great there, but this is um, average cloud cover. It could be a very clear day. Last year at April 8th, beautiful sunny day. I think it was cloudy in Texas. And so it's we can't control it, but we just hope for the best. The last one in New Brunswick was July 10th, 1972. Now, eclipses are very rare. New Brunswick's area is about one seven thousandth of the uh, surface area of the Earth, right? And we get about 80 total eclipses a century. And this is averaged over the last 1,100 years. So in the last 1,100 years, we have eight, eight total eclipses of the sun that have touched at least a part of New Brunswick. And this was the last one here in July 10th, 1972. Got the north part of the province and down the east coast and went off before it got to Moncton. So St. John, Fredericton, Edmondson up here, they were all out of it. Bathurst, Camelton, they were in it. Right, the other ones have been two others up here like that. There's been one that was the uh, total phase of a hybrid eclipse that went across the central part of New Brunswick, actually up through here. Miramichi was in that one. So Miramichi, the cities up here have all been in two or three times in the last 1,100 years. St. John had one, went right through, this was in 1569, came down oh, cool. this way, and went through the middle of St. John. All right, so where uh, Chris and I and Mike are sitting, we happen to be here at that time, we would have been outside the shadow, but if you're in uptown area, or down, down, uptown, you would have been just in the shadow. Nature Park would have been in it. Right, and been a couple others been down this way. So that's where it's going to be. Our next one, May 1st, 2079. All right, that's 55 years from now. Now look at this. 
Here's the center line of it. Coming down here. Down by Yarmouth. There's a place in here called Quinnan, I believe. Yeah. And there's a deep sky observatory in there, not too far from the central line. So, Tim, if you're watching, before you go to bed tonight, book your four best rooms that you're going to have there in 2079. <laughs> each one of us. And we want to have a double seniors discount. <laughs> before, you, before your internet swings off the wall. All right. All we can do is hope. There we go. <laughs> Double uh, senior discount. Awesome, Kurt. That's a, that was a great talk, and he covered all the bases. Um, I mean, anybody. I, look, I love St. John. Why? I don't know. I love no. I do love St. John. Been here all my life, right? But uh, I won't be in St. John for the eclipse, and I wouldn't be because it's that close. You know, you're not going to find one that's going to be this close to you. If you're in this province, than the one that's happening right now, besides 2079. So, you know, you drive an hour and you're into two minutes and 17 seconds, I guess, in Predicton. So you don't have to go. I mean, I guess it's probably because we're, it's a circle coming across the planet. So if you're down at the bottom part, you're not going to be in that zone very long, right? <clears throat> so farther up, you are to the middle. Yep. It's, it's not a circle for us. It's stretching out into that's a right. ellipse. Yeah. yeah. To be a circle, pretty much. When the moon, the sun and moon are directly overhead, or at right. their highest points. And, and. So you get less of it when you're down around the bo the, bo the border or the boundary of it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're going to be this close. To, you know, the difference between 98.7% and 100% is just like, you know, you know horseshoes. <laughs> but you also want to give yourself time because there will be a lot of traffic. Yeah. Headed up the highway and going north of New Brunswick, <laughs> or coming. Well, if, yeah. if, if we weren't already scheduled to be in a location, I'd be looking at the weather forecast the night before. I'd be checking it hourly, and get, getting up in the morning and deciding, okay, where in the province, if the, if it is partly cloudy, you know, where in the province do I want to be, kind of thing, and still have the opportunity to, to travel, you know, a distance before three thirty. So you've got, you know, you still got a fair amount of time before totality hits at four thirty. So. Well, it's going through Ontario, but it's going through Niagara Falls, and they're expecting over a million people in Niagara Falls alone. Yeah. <laughs> Those highways are going to be packed solid. <laughs> both, both the U.S. side and the... Yeah. Just give yourself time if you decide you're going to drive you know, north from St. John. Make sure you leave early, because it will be packed. Emil yeah. says here... Uh... If we get clouded out on April 8th, a good topic for the show would be what places in the world will get a total solar eclipse for those of us willing to travel instead of waiting for 2079. There is one in, in the Middle East that's traveling over Egypt, right? Um, on my birthday, you know. there's a few years, there's a few years time that traveling right over the pyramids and uh, yeah. pyramids inside it. So. Timeanddate.com will show you all the eclipses that are coming anyway and where they're going. So, yeah. Right. Most of my information, the maps there, they're from EclipseWise, uh, and the maps are by Fred Espinac. And there you can you can play with them. You can go in there and look at the, all the eclipse maps for 20-year periods. Uh, you, know, you pick one out there, then you can go on that one individually and bring up a map. You can bring it up in Google Maps and expand it out to what you want. I know. Um, just looking for other questions here. We have uh, totality for us in Cornwall. That's cool, man. Um, I remember in 72, our teachers closed the blinds. <laughs> uh, somebody said, uh, hi guys, sorry late joining. If you have a telescope, how do you view it being safe? The only way to view it being safe with a telescope is to have a filter on the front of your telescope, not down by the eyepiece. Uh, you need the actual, the actual solar filter, bother film, the same, almost the same stuff, I guess, as the glasses are made out of. Um, and it's, it has to be specially fitted for your telescope uh, you can make your own i know there are places on their youtube videos online on how to make your own filter for your own telescope but it always has to go on the front of the telescope yeah and it's, and it's not the same material that's in the glasses so much it's um because you can't use the glasses with the telescope so right yeah yeah you need one made for telescopes or binoculars another question mm -hmm. i was asked was even though it's only going to be like 98% here in St. John, will it get dark enough to see stars? I would suspect you might see Venus. Yeah. Yeah. 
And Jupiter, I suppose, if it's... Perhaps, yeah. But then again, you're going to have your glasses on. They're going to be close to the sun. Yeah, okay. So if you block the sun, uh, then maybe try for Venus there. And maybe go around and part of the part of the house, maybe, where it's blocked and look for Jupiter. But, All right. Yeah. That makes good sense. Yeah. Um, some had asked me before about, about cell phones. Like, can you put uh, can you put a set of glasses over a, over a cell phone camera and take a picture that way? I don't know. I don't know whether that's protected enough. I know that they do sell um, devices that you can put it on. Yeah. But, uh, they, have, uh, they have cameras. Uh, they have uh, protection there for cameras, uh, filters for them. And cell phones, I guess, where they're small, I have seen where the people say you can use the Eclipse glasses for that. And if you're, if you're just taking pictures a couple of minutes before or a couple of minutes after totality, uh, which may be the best time to hit one. I don't think you even need a filter. I think that's what uh, Alan Dyer had said. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if you're going to do a live stream, maybe with your phone, you might not want to do a capture a video for a long period of time. But I don't, I'm, and I know you've got another camera on the front of your phone too. So, yeah. Can you, I've heard of people saying, well, you can just do a selfie kind of mode and yeah. you know, capture it that way. You know, you're not, you're not even looking at the sun. Yeah. I, but I don't know. I, I mean, I've done sunrises and sunsets with my phone on Facebook, live feeds, just with yeah. my phone and no protection over the front of it. It's never bothered my phone. But. Yeah. And the intensity of the sun when it's down low like that is much less than when it's up yeah. higher in the sky. Yeah. So that's true. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions on here? Uh, shout them out if you have any. Um, I'll be watching for, uh, for anything else. But I think we're, are you guys participating in all the, uh, NASA, uh, um, we're not taking part in that one, no. Is McAdam actually in the path of totality or just on the edge, Kurt? <laughs> Runs right through the town, village. <laughs> Runs right through the town. <laughs> does it no, run I'll or does it, does it like slow crawl? <laughs> if somebody from McAdam will be there on uh, April 5th going to talk at the station at 4 o'clock. Okay. 2 o'clock at the at the high school. And how long do you get there from McAdam? Uh, well, about 18 seconds at the station. In another part of town, you might get up to 30. Oh, okay. Uh, the butter solar film sheets come with the directions for uh, on building the mount for them uh, for your scope. There you go. So uh, it comes from Derek. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Andrew says it will be interesting to see how the animals adjust and adapt to the brief period for darkness. That should be really interesting. So you guys will be going live to share. No, we won't be going live, Nikita. Um, we're going to be uh, in a location that is going live. We're going to be in Florenceville, the three of us. Uh, the evening before, we'll be doing our show and in live from Florenceville. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show from Florenceville. And then that day, uh, we're going to be, we've been inviting that up there to help out uh, with the Eclipse Bloom project. So the project that Kurt was talking about, the balloon going up to 100,000 feet and, uh, with the cameras all on board and one looking at the horizon and Actually, they're going to be live streaming down to five locations, five communities uh, in the Florenceville area. And then they have just announced that they are going to feed it out on YouTube as well. So there will be a YouTube, they do have a YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's eclipseplus.ca. I'll have to look it up. Anyway, but they're going to stream it out, but they're not going to have uh, any commentary with it. It's just going to be the live stream. So we will be streamed uh, on their end anyway. Um, but. Will Camelton uh, Airbnb totality, you know, the best thing, Wayne, is to go to timeanddate.com, <laughs> go up to the top right-hand corner, type in Camelton, and then look for eclipses. It'll show you, it'll bring up all these boxes, and just click on Eclipse, and it'll tell you exactly how much time we have, uh, if it is totality or not, and it'll tell you the time it starts and stops and the whole bit. So it's a great site, I, I find, timeanddate.com, and a lot of people have asked me, is it going to be fine for me in here and there, and I just send them there. I had a picture of St. John and Campbell, what it looked like, and both of them are about 99%. 99%, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, not 100. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can get to the zone, if look, if you have the opportunity to get inside that zone, do it. You, you won't regret it, really. It'll, it'll be, if it's a clear day, I promise you, it'll be something you'll remember the rest of your life. Yeah. And hang on to those eclipse glasses. Take yes. care of them, because we have four more partial eclipses coming up this decade. Next year, a good one. Next year, in March 14th. One year after that, we skip a year. Then 28 and 29, you have partial eclipses. Right. So don't throw them away. 
Hang on. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kurt. I know we're into Welcome. a little later, but uh, we're going to get into a vinyl bed here anyway. We've got a Rosanna quick, and then we'll sign off. Well, on a vinyl bed, you ready? Uh, Paul, can you meet us in Florence? Well, absolutely. We'll be there. Tiny autographs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll set, Mike. Go ahead. All righty. Uh, they should be coming up here. Ah. So, binocular target of the week this week, and because we're talking eclipses and stuff, it's a special binocular target of the week, but it's going to be two weeks away. It's a uh, binocular target is the sun during the eclipse. <laughs> there are very few times, you know, that uh, you get a chance to see this, but you can use binoculars safely to stare and watch the eclipse as it goes by on the sun. Warning, though, do not look at the sun without using the proper solar filters in front of the binoculars. If you don't have that, there's another method I'll show you partway through that you can use your binoculars in order to catch the eclipse. And safety first, use the proper solar filters only. So a total solar eclipse will take place uh, in the moon's ascending node on Monday, April the 8th, 2024. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon uh, passes between the Earth and the sun, thereby obscuring the image of the sun for the viewer on the Earth. A total solar eclipse occurs when the moon's apparent diameter is larger than the sun's diameter, blocking all the direct sunlight, uh, turning the day into darkness. And while it's going on, you can watch for sunspots. How do I find it in the sky? Well, it's not going to be too <laughs> difficult. <laughs> on April the 8th, but if you must know, at around uh, 3.15, I would go outside, orient yourself 240 degrees to the southwest, look up, there will be the sun. If you do look at the sun, wear proper safety glasses. And... Uh, you know, get your if you're going to use your binoculars to watch uh, as the eclipse goes on, make sure you have the filters on the outside of your, your binoculars. But if you don't, you can set them up on a tripod like this. Build yourself a little shade and use a projection method, and it'll project an image of the sun, and you can actually see sunspots and everything else as the uh, moon is starting to cross in front of the sun, and you're going to see everything you would see if you were looking at, at the sun with proper filters on. It depends on the filter you use. Some of them will be orange, some of them will be white light. But you can safely do it this way, and you can track the sun. You know, you're going to watch for parts of uh, what they call a partial eclipse, where you're going to see a black disc moving in front of the white disc or a nice black disc moving in front of the orange disc. And if you choose, in 10 by 50 binoculars, this is the site you're going to see if you use the projection method. It's really, really cool. And I suggest that you only use the projection method Unless you're going to have two pairs of binoculars, because you want to have, you don't want to be messing around taking filters off and putting them back on when it comes to totality. At totality, mm -hmm. you don't need your binoculars, right? Let, leave the filters on and just watch the eclipse as you can when it's time. And the and as the disc is leaving the sun again, bring your binoculars back up with the filters on properly, <laughs> or watch this what <coughs> This is, is what it's going to look like. You're going to have a black disc. Moving in front of an orange disc. Excuse me for a second. Okay, compared to the full moon, well, it, the full moon's actually bigger than the sun. So you're going to fit it all in. Here it comes. Why did the teachers quit their jobs <coughs> after watching the solar eclipse without proper filters? They couldn't control their pupils. <laughs> 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 Binocular target of the week by a bino bud. <laughs> oh, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> okay, Mike, that projection method. Um, do you need do you need the uh, filters on your no binos? You don't. No. Projection method straight through, not, not no. on the on the uh, binoculars. Okay. You can awesome. do the same thing with a telescope projection method as long as it's a reflector or a refractor, not a yeah. reflector. Right. Yeah. And you can you know set a card back and see the same thing. Okay. Awesome. It, the energy's not pointed. At, there's there's a point where the energy g gets right to a, where your um, the exit pupil is on, on the thing. So at that point, that's where the energy is con is converged. Right. Then from there, as it starts to spread apart again, the energy starts to dissipate. So by using that projection method, you're not going to burn a hole in anything. I actually right. set up with a diagonal in my garage, pointed my uh, refractor at the sun. And the diagonal eyepiece was firing the light up on my white garage door, and I was looking at the sun and sunspots uh, on the garage door and the ceiling as the garage door was open. It was pretty cool. So 
So Amelia, a good point here. Beware doing the projection method with kids nearby. They may try to get behind them and look. Yeah, so we got to have to, yeah. kids have to be watched through this event. They have to be, you know, yeah. when they put their glasses on, they might want to, you know, take a look at, but make yeah. sure they're up around their face. Uh, I showed something on their little pie plate thing that could shove their glasses through. Put a strap on them if you think. You can make a small hole on either side and put elastic around the back and that'll hold them tight on their head. Or you can just put a big, a big piece of pie on the pie plate and just... And then... <laughs> Stay there. And with that, how would we go from there to a Rosanna's fun fact? <laughs> uh, quickly with a question here. Uh, so another question someone asked, if, uh, is it any different when you were to watch the sun, if you were to watch the sun without glasses versus an eclipse? Hmm? Ask that question again. <laughs> is, it, is it any different when you were to watch the sun without glasses versus an eclipse. Oh, same, well, same you, sunlight. Yeah. Same, same sunlight. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't look at the sun today, don't look at it during the eclipse, right? Without protection on. Yeah. So it's still, still very painful. All right. Okay. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> All yours. <laughs> I was waiting for you to go. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, here is this week's. Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey, welcome back, Rosanna, for another crazy fun fact for this week so i'll get right to it because we are running a little late there so let me just find more picture do i need to put up there i think i just have to screen that down and where is it i know it's here somewhere there it is all right so rosanna writes hi paul the fun fact might be called a fearful or full of fear about eclipses fun facts as most of us know, historically, eclipses were fearful events. Whether you are an avid literary fan or just a few books, a year type of soul, you already know some recurring themes that appear over and over from Dickinson's to Stephanie Myers. Readers should never trust a stranger in a gloomy tavern. <laughs> That's from the Treasure Island from the Lord of Rings. Readers should also, should also realize that somehow falling in love with the arch enemy is always possible. That's from Weathering Heights. And most importantly, eclipses, hell was spelled doom. Although open to interpretation, Homer's The Odyssey makes reference to a potential eclipse predicted by a murderous soothsayer, a dreadful sign appears above. The sun is veiled in mist, and darkness covers all the fertile earth, reads a modern trans, uh, translation. Jump ahead a few centuries, and then an eclipse is uh, the, the harbinger of the death of Christ. The famous instance occurs in Gospels in Matthew 27, 45, when the text says, And there was darkness over the whole earth in the middle of the afternoon. This has long been interpreted as an eclipse. Fast forward to the renaissance of John Milton's um, Paradise Lost. And of course, Shakespeare. Oops, I bumped that one out in the wrong place. And the Eclipse King Lear's, uh, uh, the Eclipse King Lear warns of dark times to come. The Eclipse um, in Moby Dick is a metaphor reinforced over and over again throughout the book. Even as more scientific study and knowledge about eclipses spread, authors from Mark Twain, Isaac Eisenhoff, right down to Stephen King still used eclipses to unsettle the, and scare their readers or cause the characters to go mad. Let's face it, almost everybody is at some point in time scared of the dark and scared of the unknown. And of course, light is good. Dark is evil is a well-established theme. So are we scared for the April 8th eclipse? <laughs> so what are we scared for in the April 8th eclipse? <laughs> Clouds. <laughs> but if I had a little good news on the cloudy front, 
if April the 8th dawns with a silky field like cumulus clouds, fear not. Cumulus clouds, um, cumulus, sorry, cumulus clouds, the low flying fluffy ones with flat bottoms and puffy tops dissipate as an eclipse begins. According to a recent paper in the journal Communications Earth and Environment, the authors found that the moon needs to obscure a mere 15% of the sun to initiate cloud clearing. Past satellite data hinted at the surprising occurrence um, of, a, of a, the cumulus clouds dissipating during these celestial events. By measuring cloud, or but rather measuring clouds during the actual eclipse was much trickier because algorithms for predicting cloud cover and destiny didn't density, sorry, didn't occur for the uh, decrease in solar radiation. Researchers were left in the dark hmm, until they created a new model, which accounts for the percent of the sun obscured throughout the eclipse. Using the new approach, lead author Victor Trees and his research team at the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute and Delft University and Technology were able to revisit old satellite measurements from three eclipses a couple of dec decades ago. Oh, back to that one again. So they discovered a chain reaction. So the eclipses, the eclipse caused changes at ground level when it turned, when in turn affects the cloud cover, blocking sunlight cools Earth's surface. This temperature change slows the rise of warm air and water vapor, which is responsible for cumulus cloud formation. So less sun means lower temperature on the ground, which leads to fewer clouds. That's where it, the 15% threshold becomes important. That's the small fraction of sun that needs to be obscured for clouds to thin out. But stay on land. If you are out at sea, you won't see the phenomena at all. When the eclipse's shadow passes over the ocean, cumulus clouds will remain unchanged as the ocean doesn't cool down as easily as land. And if you are out in space, the eclipse is going to look like this. This image is a solar eclipse which that was taken from the former Mir space station on the 11th of August, 1999. What about the other nine basic types of clouds? Unfortunately, if they obscure our view, we are out of luck. So don't look at solar eclipses. What solar eclipse? <laughs> They're all on their phones. And that is this week's. Rosanna's Fun Fact. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosanna. And another wonderful fun fact. And I didn't know that about cumulus clouds, that they actually dissipate uh, during that event because of the uh, change. Yeah. No oh. idea either. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope that happens. Well, let's hope that happens. Day, I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> let's just hope we don't have to think even think about it. But uh, we'll uh, fingers across, of course. And so next week, uh, that's our show then for this evening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the program tonight. Special thanks again to our guest, Kurt Nason. Thank you for joining us again this evening, Kurt. Great pleasure. Yeah. I'm going to bring you on again after the eclipse, and we'll talk all about our experience. Yeah. Um, so we are continuing our discussion about the, uh, the eclipse over the next couple of weeks. Uh, next week's uh, guest will join us to discuss more about the Eclipse Bloom Project. Um, so uh, another special thanks to again, to, of course, to Rosanna once again for her fabulous fun facts. Rosanna, thank you very much. Always timely and always informative. Um, and to all of you who share the program for us uh, out there, uh, thank you all. And remember too, we do love sharing your photos, so please send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com and we'll be happy to put them on our next broadcast. And send in some photos because I didn't have any this week. <laughs> a special thanks again to uh, all of our friends at Rogers for joining us this evening. So until next week, everybody, we're wishing you all clear skies. As just, but if you want to just save that for the one day, that's okay too. Uh, as we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes pointed up. Yep. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Good night. And cue the music. He says, uh, probably this one. Uh, we'll go here.